As a consumer, all the decisions that we all make drives the industry and then the market indirectly. Seven out of ten products fail if they don't understand the consumers that they're dealing with. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Al Voxup, and I'm very pleased to welcome you tonight to Entrepreneurship 101. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Our speaker is Usha Srinivasan. She is the program director of the Business Acceleration Program at Mars. Usha is responsible for building and leading the Market Intelligence Services team at Mars. And when she came here, this team consisted of two interns that were providing market research intelligence to the whole province. And that team has quickly grown to a team of eight, and they're now meeting the demands of the growing um, entrepreneurship landscape in Ontario. Before Usha joined Mars, she worked at Frost & Sullivan, where she published key research papers and consulted for a variety of companies and managed a group of analysts to provide quality research. She also has a technical and industry background in water, environment, and building technologies, and she's worked with global clients such as GE, IBM, Honeywell, and Brita. Usha also holds a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Bristol and a PhD in Environmental Studies from University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Usha is a big supporter of our Entrepreneurship 101 program. This is her third time presenting the Market Analysis Lecture here, so please join me in welcoming Usha to the stage tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Marielle, for that introduction. I'm not sure who she was talking about there. Uh, um, essentially, I'm a lab rat uh, masquerading in a suit. Um, I have been doing research for over 20 years. Seems like a long time. But the first eight years, probably uh, lab research, uh, journal-based literature search. And the second eight years, I did market research, industry research. In the past four years, I have the pleasure, distinct pleasure, of working with you entrepreneurs and, and startup companies here in, uh, in Ontario. Um, and I'm hoping in the next 40 minutes um, that I can share some of the learnings that I've had um, over these years. Um, maybe the takeaway that, uh, that, that you can take is uh, today, as a cash-strapped uh, startup, an entrepreneur, how could you leverage um, key intelligence and information in growing your business. Um, so before I get started, I just want to get a poll of who I'm speaking to. I'm, I'm never sure what the mix of uh, people end up in the Entrepreneurship 101. How many of you uh, uh, are thinking of starting a business? Hands up, please. Just thinking? <laughs> just thinking. <laughs> How many of you already have a business? OK. Okay, so keep hands up. How many of you actually have sales from your business? Oh, there's a few hands. So you're making money. Um, so there is there an in-between category that I missed out? <laughs> okay, well, that's the in-between category. Uh, that's good. That's a good mix of people. So, oh, I forgot my uh, advancer here. So what are we talking about here? Um, what is customer industry market intelligence? Um, OK, we all had, just think about your day today. Uh, we woke up, you go to your, the first thing I do is make coffee. So you went to your uh, coffee maker, the brand that you chose. Then you put in the coffee, that, the coffee brand that you chose in it to make your coffee and so on. You get ready, get into the brand of car that you chose, and then you get on to your work. So essentially, you have probably made well over maybe 5,000 decisions today, easily, doing various things. Um, and that's what drives everything. So the, the, as a consumer, all the decisions that we all make uh, drives the industry and then the market indirectly. So today, you have made various decisions, whether it's the food and drink that you have had, the types of clothes you wear, entertainment choices, iPod, Blackberry, uh, transportation, media, home, um, health and beauty, ladies, the, all the choices that we make. Um, you have essentially uh, decided for large corporations what brands you've chosen. 
you know what the biggest nightmare of the, the corporations is? That the, all the choices that you have been making, they have to find out why you like certain things and what decisions you make. And God forbid if the, if the product is for a teenager because they're going to change their mind every second. Um, that And collect all of that intelligence and make some decisions on what their next product line is going to be, what, how they're going to sell, and so on. So that's what we're talking about here, right? But you as, an, uh, as a startup, you know, you are cash strapped, you don't have the billions of dollars of money to spend to do this analysis. So I'm hopefully trying to give you some pointers on how you could do that in this, in this space. Um, so why is it important to make this decision? Obviously, um, seven out of 10 products fail if they don't understand the consumers that they're dealing with. Uh, people recognize this product, probably don't. You know, Coors is a uh, alcoholic drink. When they came up with a bottled water, people said, something is missing in this alcohol. You know, <laughs> I, I like the previous version. I don't like the bottled water. Uh, I, again, similarly with New Coke, people didn't like the fact that people didn't, you know, respect the audience of Coke and came up with the New Coke, the Betamax, the Apple Newton, and so on and so on. The Apple Newton specifically, the reason, you know, the, the three reasons that industry people give is it was too bulky, it was $700 a pop, too expensive, and the writing um, software didn't work well. So there's many reasons, but ultimately they didn't, even though these large corporations were involved in um, in these product lines, they didn't get the, uh, the messaging right or the, the needs of the customers right. This last one down here, does anybody recognize this? This is a GE product. It looks like a fire hydrant. When GE bought one of the largest membrane uh, technology companies here in, um, in Ontario called uh, Xenon, they decided, let's go into the residential water treatment market. Let's make this $10,000 fire hydrant looking thing to, to treat the residential water water in North America. Nobody's really concerned that much that they would switch a $10,000 one with a Brita filter at home in, in, in their, at the sink level. So that didn't fly either. So I'm just trying to make a point. Large corporations also can make a mistake. So let's assume for a minute that you all have an idea in mind. You have to go through this journey with me. Um, let's assume that you figured out the pain point is not just a cool idea. You're solving something, some problem. Um, you've, you think it's worth solving. Uh, basically what I'm saying is the amount of R&D or money that you're gonna spend is not going to be overshadowed by the amount of money you can actually make in that. It's, it's worth it to solve. Hopefully it's disruptive uh, or at least competitive enough that you can replace something. Um, so what's next? Most people will say, okay, now that you've decided what you're going to do, the key thing is market strategy. I think there's going to be a lecture on go-to-market strategy in a few weeks, which will be a good segue from here. But uh, how do you get there? And how I'm going to tell you how you can use information, intelligence, uh, to, to a gathering of different information to, to get to this point. Um, to ensure that you have a successful product launch. Um, you could understand who else you might be competing with. There might be other people out there already thinking of this, doing this, and you haven't realized. How big a space are you going to go after? Is it, are you spending all this time and effort to go after a $1 million market or a $10 billion market? You don't know that, right? Who's, who's interested to, to in it, and are they willing to pay for it? Um, so next, the consumers, whether it's the B2B to the industry or a person um, or a, a geography, you need to know where you're going to sell. And last but not least, how you're going to make the money? You know, what is the business model? You can answer all of these kind of questions with some of the basic information that you gather. Um, everybody with me so far? Okay. Before we get there, um, you should. I, I just want to take a minute to say, when you're gathering information, one of the key things is: Are you asking the right questions to get to that point? Um, Often, I have a team of eight, I think some of them are here. I didn't want to say, you know, mandatory, come and see me present, boss woman. No, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> Chris is sitting over there, I don't know who else is here. Um, but they get some really wacky questions sometimes, you know, and they're very gracious about it. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I think there was a wacky question like, how many Baba kegs? 
uh, are sold in the world? Anybody's guess. Um, but essentially what I'm trying to get at is it's important to know there was a reason why the entrepreneur asked that question. Uh, I'm going to give you a few examples. And let's see if you can guess what the real question was. Someone wanted to know how many hogs were slaughtered in farms each year because of swine flu infection. Any, any takers? What do you think the technology was that they needed to know that? Just shout it out. Vaccine? Eh, no. Kind of getting there. Disposal? What? Disposal? No. It was actually a rapid DNA test for swine flu. What they wanted to know is what is their market size? So a better way of asking that question would have been how many rapid DNA testing companies are there and are they looking at swine flu, for example? and among other communicable diseases. That's a different way to ask the same question. And you know, obviously, we, we help our entrepreneurs to get to the right question, but I'm just trying to get you into the frame of mind when you formulate the questions for yourself to think about what is, what do you, what is likely to be published or written that I can probably get to get to the answer. A few other ones like that. Uh, somebody wanted to know the psychology behind scratch and save campaigns uh, driving people to redeem um, in comparison to regular coupons. Essentially what they're asking about is consumer attitude towards loyalty programs, right? It's not the scientific paper about the psychology of it, but more about loyalty programs. Other things, how many people work out at home? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. Um, so one of the things that we could look at is how many people are buying ex exercise e equipment one of the things could be that, or other apps in general, um, you know, there are health and fitness apps that are downloaded more, something like that could get to that answer. And then the fourth one is uh, related to uh, digital health solutions, but for employees, essentially it's a wellness program. So uh, you get the point here, you know, what I'm trying to make. Asking the right questions matters. Um, what are the different sources of information? Now that you formulated the right kind of questions, there's basically two types of information. This is not gonna be uh, new for uh, people who are in the university. You know, you, you do, you've done research, you know what this is. Secondary sources, things that have already been published, right? You're going to, somebody has already done the work and you're just consuming it. And the primary research is something that you would have to do on your own. There's only, you probably can get 60% of the way of all the information you want to get through secondary sources, and some things you just can't answer with that. For example, there might be a pricing-related question or a attitude-related question about your particular product that you can only get from a person-to-person -person interview with someone. Um, so those are the two main uh, sources. So let's go into a little bit more detail on each of them. Uh, secondary sources, um, I don't have a pointer, but essentially the, the internal uh, resources. Let's assume that you're building your company, you have a few other people you've bought, brought on board. Don't underestimate the internal mining of information. That other person might have been in another organization or company, unless you actually actively ask, who else knows about this? And what other information do, you, do we already have internally um, you, you, you don't know what you don't know, basically. There might be a gap there that you could be filling. So don't underestimate the internal. Next is the external resources. That is everybody's published stuff that you're already familiar with, print and electronic. The internet, uh, you know, everybody's talking about big data. They, we actually have quite a lot of companies that, uh, that have been started here um, that, that work with Mars that is around big data. Um, you know, they have unique algorithms and web crawlers that are able to go into uh, areas where they can mine information that specifically can answer uh, the business or a sales problem of a particular organization. So that's a big movement. So that's almost changing the way traditional research is being done. And of course, you have syndicated research, and we'll talk more about that. Um, these are just, I wanted to mention a few common resources that, uh, that, we, that you probably will look at. Um, I, I think, uh, Marielle, correct me if I'm wrong, these slides will be available to the participants. Of the, so I'm sorry it's text heavy. You don't have to read it all or write it all at this time, but I want the information to be helpful even after the presentation so you can you know, download it and use it. 
So obviously, any kind of government st statistical agencies are helpful. Uh, they collect all kinds of data that, you know, how many people have the internet or how many people have, uh, uh, are using certain devices, et cetera. So you, you, that can be helpful. Conference Board of Canada, and the industry market research firms, we'll talk a little bit more about them. A uh, little bit, uh, you know, I've mentioned some names here. They're publishing on industry statistics as well as uh, and, and market size and market share of companies plus consumer type of uh, research. I just want to say, I might be using words interchangeably, but con marketing research is more consumer based and market research is more industry type of stuff. Um, and then professional organizations, don't forget, there's, there's all, I think there's a professional organization for pretty much everything these days, uh, but they do have a mandate to publish for various things. For example, the one that I have put there is uh, I'm, I'm in the clean tech space and water space, that, as Marielle said. American Water Works Association, they're like the face of the municipality. They do these large surveys of 700 municipalities every year about how much money they're gonna spend on various retrofits and what, what not. But you know, that's valuable information if you're going to be in that, if you're in that space. So similarly, other uh, you know, functional based organizations are also there that you can leverage. Last but not least, I wanted to uh, point out, you may, or may, or may not know if you're a client of Mars or not, is our Mars startup library. Chris is over here, she's my leader, creating content with my team. Um, it's the curated list of public links on various topics. It's both business topics and, um, and uh, subject matter uh, stuff, but it's meant to save you time surfing, looking for stuff, and just go and find the information easily. So if you have suggestions, you know, write to us about that and leverage that. And then the entrepreneurship toolkit that you probably, Carrie has mentioned to you before, if you've, uh, uh, who manages the education team, it goes in depth into various business uh, matters. So this, these are things that you can leverage on the secondary resource. Let's dive into primary stuff. So large corporations spend hell of a lot of money on doing various type of marketing related research. Um, everything from the things that I've bolded and in, 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 you know, highlighted in red, I'm assuming are things that you might want to start looking at as, in, as a startup. Not everything might be re, uh, you know, relevant to you at the moment. But attitudes, concept testing, um, uh, segmentation studies basically means you know, which gender or the income group or, or uh, ethnicity is interested in your product. That's what segmentation is. Um, new product testing, pricing, very important, and so on. And the various methods, there's quite a lot of different ways in which you can gather that. The last one down there is called omnibus study that I mentioned there. It's essentially these, remember these market research firms we just talked about? Those guys do that all the time. Uh, they're able to get multiple clients into, into paying for one study of course, it's not gonna tell you specifically what you're looking for for your product. It's going to be a broad study that meets many people's, their clients' needs, but it's still helpful about a particular product line that in that space, so it's still helpful. But you could potentially be doing things on your own. So I've, I've tried to highlight a few things, online and direct interviews that specifically would be helpful for startups. So the first one, uh, online could be probably the lowest cost option for you, but it also can be a little risky depending on uh, who's responding on the other side. I have a very precocious 11-year-old, and if he finds out that people pay for these kinds of things, he might actually take advantage of it. So, so you, ha you don't know who on the other end is responding to your questionnaire. So you just have to be careful that you're um, working with a legitimate uh, organization. Uh, I have put examples of some sites there. I realize that uh, SurveyMonkey and Zoomerang have merged, so they're not two separate companies anymore. Um, but there are different uh, vendors who can help you. They have template, templated questionnaire for various types of attitude or other types of things that you want to ask that you can use um, to, to get, in, uh, get information. The other things not to, not to um, uh, forget is listservs of various organizations and specific interest groups. I find this obviously there's quite a lot, you know, from you know, people who like 
cats to whatever, different types of uh, professional and um, other personal groups, which you can use to ask and poll you know, uh, people on likes and dislikes of various things informally. Obviously, it's not going to give you a quantitative number, like 100 people said they like X, X or Y, and Z, but it's going to give you a feel for what is the attitude of maybe 20, 50 people. Um, um, and then the direct interviews, I think uh, um, last year I presented along with my colleague from Frost and Sullivan, and he said, don't forget your friends and family. They and the extended family, you know, there's, you maybe it's a soccer group or your other whatever spinning group, et cetera. You could be polling many people or uh, helping them, uh, you know, get together to ask questions on, you know, I have this idea, this, this product line, would that be, interest to, be of interest to you? What would you pay for it? You, you could get a lot of information just expanding in that. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, cross-sectional and longitudinal panels. What that means essentially is, you know, if you're polling them once, one time, what is the, the advantage of you using your friends and family is you don't have to just poll them one time. Because you know them, you could go back to them uh, you know, a few months from now, ask again and again for free feedback on various things. That's the advantage you have with, with friends and family that others don't have with uh, you know, other, uh, you know, other people that they poll. Um, what else did I want to talk about here? Uh, the, the, the reasoning, of course, with long, longitudinal panels is, you know, let's say, you know, Toyota, uh, you know, let's say uh, this gentleman over here loves Toyota until they had that incident with the safety. I'm like, he, and he, then he changes his mind. I no longer believe that Toyota is a good product, uh, you know, car company. So by going back to the individuals, there could have been some incident in there that they have experienced or something that changes their mind about their mindset about that product. So that's, it's always helpful to do that. Um, so this cycle of gathering, secondary research, primary research, you know, filling the gap, and then analyzing it, and then go, d d devising a go-to-market strategy, it's not a one-time thing. You have to do intelligence gathering throughout the life cycle of your company. Uh, uh, you might need various things. You might, one minute, you'll be asking about competing products. Another time, you might be asking about you know, is there a company I want to acquire? You might be big enough that you want to do that, or various things. So, you know, there's so many things that you'll be thinking about throughout your life cycle. So this is, never think of it as a one-time affair. And most large corporations have a huge market intelligence team within their groups that are collecting and, and feeding back this into the marketing uh, organization, uh, you know, lead of the, of the, of the group. Um, so, everybody with me? So far, am I going too fast? Um, so remember the first slide we, we started off with. How can you use intelligence to um, do various things? You know, who you're competing with, the market size, all of that. We're going to del delve a little deeper into each of these. Okay. Um, so initially, uh, the first question that we ask: Who am I competing with? Obviously, if you're in a very nascent stage, you're going to be asking about, you know, are there other patents out there? similar to mine, you know, who else, who owns that patent? Is it a large corporation? Is it a small company? Um, how diverse is their portfolio? You're going to be asking all of these questions. There's, I'm sure if you're, a, you know, if you're across the road from U of T, you're a scientist, you've done some kind of patent search. Um, how many of you here have done patent searches before in public domains? See, there are some already. So you, you are familiar with that. You could go into public uh, databases to do that, USPTO and, and WIPO for, the, for that. We actually have access to proprietary databases for ourselves. We're not patent experts. You obviously, after initial search, it's better to go work with a patent agent. Um, but we have access to certain databases that helps you to do that a little bit easier. Um, if you're looking for more established companies, then don't underestimate the kind of information people put out at trade shows or even on their websites. It's mind-boggling why anybody would put so much specification on their product, products on, on the site, but they do. So, you know, it's it, leverage that. Um, and you can always, I mean, trade shows are wonderful. In some industries, you have to show up in a trade show every year. 
uh, to be you know, of any significance, otherwise you'll, be, you'll, you'll not be relevant. Um, but you could be at the trade show uh, you know, doing some mystery shopping, <laughs> or talking to some of your competitors, understanding what they, uh, what they have to offer. That's never, um, don't underestimate that for sure. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, the startup library source that we have, we actually have a segment called How Do I Identify Competitors? There's some really good links to various resources. Please do take time to look at those. And of course, the syndicated research that we already talked about. These uh, organizations spend time, uh, the time that you and I probably don't have, is spent on that particular industry, speaking to all the competitors in that space and understanding who, is, who are the new emergents um, in that market. Um, they, they tier them based on the size of the organization. So it gives you a good idea of who you're going to be competing with. Okay? The next ominous question that we always get asked, you know, how big is my market? Tell me how big it is. Um, so obviously it's, a, it's an in, important question because that drives everything. You want to know that you're going after a big space that, that you can leverage uh, as an entrepreneur startup. Um, and there are very different neat ways to, to find that information. So again, going back to these published documents um, that people have spent time putting together. Remember that these are just people like you and I, so the reports are only as good as the analyst who wrote that report. So we always encourage um, our entrepreneurs to look at multiple sources uh, of information. Uh, we also encourage our entrepreneurs to ask questions about the definition they've used. You know, maybe they added a service element or there's some quirkiness. Especially when you buy reports and you don't see the definition in the beginning of the report, you have as a, an, a person who's bought the report opportunity to ask a question. You pick up the phone and say, I just bought this report. I need to know, you know what the definition is for this. So you have the right to do that. Of course, you could try and do market sizing on your own. Uh, it's difficult to do it on your own. It's, uh, I mean, you have to do it sometimes if it's in your, in your operating in the private space and, you know, and there isn't much information out there and it's hard at, if the reports are not getting you where, where you want to be. Um, you could try to do uh, it in many different ways. So, for example, uh, the bottom-up method is like simple. You know, you know, if you know that the participants in that space, if they're in, in the public domain, you know the kind of revenues that they probably have and you can, you know, assess how big that space is going to be. They're privately held, probably difficult. Um, other ways to do it is just by the number of consumers. You know, how many hospitals or how many um, users of that site. You know, that gives you a number of customer base and that gives you a rough idea of how, the, how big the market might be. Um, in the companies which are, you know, both privately or publicly held, uh, annual reports, I know people you know, think uh, you know, these are just public documents. I mean, how great could the information be? In fact, in, because remember, these annual reports are going to the board. They try to write about the best, their best product line. They're showcasing things that they're good at. That gives you a lot of clue about this is our best product for the year, or you know, there's a percentage there. You know the full uh, revenues of the organization. So 90% came from this particular product. You can assume what their revenues might be for that, uh, for that year. So there's very diff various different ways. Ultimately, when you go to investors, people don't like seeing huge global numbers. Try to be realistic and say, okay, for North America, maybe my market size is X. And then, and then you add on other pieces after that. Don't go with huge global numbers without, you know, you can, you can, you can imagine the price ranges are going to be different, all kinds of other nuances. Try to make realistic assumptions, okay? Um, next very important question, where am I going to sell? And this is multi-pronged. Multi uh, you know, this, if it's a direct to consumer, it's different. To, uh, your, if you're selling to an industry um, and uh, in a different geography, um, there are quite a lot of um, information sources out there that can help you to understand this space. But um, I would say, just let's tackle just industry for now. Uh, as an entrepreneur, one of the things that you could be doing is, I hate to use the word tracking the money, but essentially, you know, who's spending what? 
Uh, unfortunately, when there's a tragedy or when there is an environmental compliance issue, then there's more money being spent on something specific, right? Uh, you know, I hate to use a 9-11 example, but you know, it's true. After that, there's a lot of security products and defense. You know, so it, it, you track, you see where the money is being poured into in, in different industries. And that is one uh, way you could maybe the entrance into that geography is easier or that industry is easier because there's more money to be, uh, to be made. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, other things, I mean, not to, uh, everybody, I don't, I don't know if people are familiar with the organization DFATE. Um, it's the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. It's a federal organization uh, from Canada. They are representatives throughout uh, the globe. Um, the reason I mention that is, of course, we live in an internet age and you can just click a button and you can read about many geographies and different companies and so on. But you know, there's certain places there are some nuances or particular partner that you need to be know about that can only come from on the ground people and these defade people are on the ground people um, and these are and, and can give you some you know if you want to do business here you must connect with this X company uh, kind of uh, specific uh, specifics that they can give you um, and of course uh, we already talked about the type of primary research you can plug into hopefully you can you see the pattern you know we talked about the type of research and how you could gather it secondary and primary and then how you plug into each of these questions that you will ask for your companies and where it uh, it um, it makes sense okay and last but not least the business model you know you know, how are you going to make money? <laughs> Good, important question. Now, this is a tricky one because obviously I don't have a crystal ball. A lot of times we get questions like, tell me what X company's price point is and their profit margin. Like, oh, it's not something we can tell um, yeah, that easily. And Chris is smiling because she gets that kind of question all the time, I think. Um, but we have tried to find some, so let's just tackle the business model question first. So one of the online resources that we have uh, on Startup Library actually is the Business Model Innovation Hub, which is uh, an online community where about almost 5,000 members gather to discuss business models. When we have actually our entrepreneurship, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, workshops, education workshops here at, uh, at Mars, often, and Lily's here who does, uh, takes care of all the workshops, and many cross-sectoral matches happen. And, and when social innovation groups meet with the technology companies, magic happens. I, I've seen that, like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. So there's often this, uh, the cross-pollination is helpful, right? Um, so things in other industries could be very relevant to yours. Um, price point, I, we, we talked about this. The only way you're going to have a sense of what it's what your competitors are going to have is do some mystery shopping. I know it's not the legal term. I didn't say it here. Okay, <laughs> it's being recorded. Um, that's the only way you're going to get a sense of you know what their real price point is, and you know, uh, and see if yours is going to be competitive or not, um, and so on. So ultimately, after all of this information gathering, okay, I love this shoe, which is a boombox and a shoe, which. Then is, this is the no-go product, right? Um, you're going to make, you want to make a sound decision. You'll have other ideas. Gather the information that you need and decide whether you want to move ahead or not. Um, you, you're an entrepreneur, you'll have better ideas. Kill the one that doesn't make sense and move on to other things. But make, make that decision based on you know, uh, proper uh, um, intelligence that you gather. Last tip I want to give. Probably you're, you're already doing this, um, but I think at this, this current time, things are so highly competitive. There's information all over the place, but you need to be on top of things if you are in, you're going to be in the game. Um, so connecting with, attend the industry events and trade shows if you can. I know it's expensive to do that, but sometimes you just need to show up um, absorb the things that you're absorbing. There could be uh, new partnerships that you make and uh, new competitors that you see. Um, subscribing to relevant things, you know, journal. I spend uh, half an hour every morning reading nothing else, reading things that happened that day. It's important to do that. Um, these uh, marketing research or market research firms that we talked about, a lot of the analysts, actually those websites, uh, you could search for 
people who are publishing in different industries. You don't have to be a subscriber. It will show up, okay, uh, Andrew so-and-so publishes in, I don't know, digital marketing or something. Uh, you could track them. They have blogs. You could track them. Their, their opinions might help you decide on some things that you're thinking about. So um, that's helpful. Um, and the last but not least, very important resource, I'm actually a member uh, of uh, the Marketing Research and Intel Intelligence Association. They have some great resources on their website um, that you can utilize. They have uh, small lectures that happen all the time throughout the year um, that you can attend and you know, uh, it, it, it can enhance the, your understanding of how you gather information. And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your time. Happy to take any questions if anybody has any, of course. Thank you, Usha, for another excellent lecture um, on market research. If we have any questions, please come up to the microphones in the aisles. Uh, thank you, Usha, for a great talk. Um, I thought you made a great suggestion around accessing your direct network uh, to gain some more insight. Uh, my question is, um, how do you ensure that, um, how do you avoid getting the yes bias from your friends and family? I know that if I ask my mom to say, hey, mom, is this a good idea? Just gonna rub my hair and say, yeah, that's excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's why the extended family might be helpful. So maybe it's uh, your brother or sister's friends who are not, you know, necessarily looking to say yes to you. Moms probably exclude. <laughs> um, people who have invested in the company probably exclude. Um, invested emotionally or, or money-wise exclude. But then the extended family would still be helpful, I think. Um, that's my short answer <laughs> for now. Thank you. Thanks.